travel and things in association with rugged wear real people real clothing real solutions present in conversation with i am your host david batsoffen and today i'm so pleased to have once again as my guest johan marie who has just brought out a new edition of snakes of southern africa and if you're scared of snakes after his first book because of the beauty of the images you're going to be terrified after this one johan good morning welcome to you morning uh, thanks for the invite david it's only a pleasure this particular book you know i always ask authors why an update so when i got your copy because i he says trying to lift it up this early in the morning um i went back and i had a look at the old version which is on the shelf behind me and the images in this one are just streets ahead of the first one you must have tapped into a lot of your friends because i'm sure you can't claim credit for every single image in this book no uh, absolutely not i had about 60 friends contributing right um, you know i i did my first book back in uh, in the early 80s when i was mm -hmm. in my early 20s and um, i've had more than my fair share of my photographs published in books over the years so i really go out of my way to get friends photographs and right. especially those that have never had a photograph published yeah snake photography because i i've watched you via facebook uh, hunkering down in the dirt lying on rocks is there nothing you won't do in order to get that image no absolutely not we really go to extremes and uh, you know snake photography is very specialized and it's hard work and you've got to yeah. put the effort in and and does the snake know this yeah, they don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> Johan, why, why the new edition? Why the update? David, for a few reasons. You know, the, uh, the previous edition came out 18 years ago. That's a long time yeah. back in science. You know, we've, we've learned a great deal in 80, 18 years. We've, um, we've learned a lot more about beha behavior and snake biology, but also very important on distribution. We have another 18 years of good data, so we have a much better idea of what occurs where. And then, of course, on the, on the first aid and medical treatment side of it, uh, things things change, things improve, and uh, there's a lot of new information. And then, as you as you pointed to the uh, on, on the on the photography, you know, the previous edition, uh, which came out in 2004, there wasn't a single digital photograph in it. Really, Quite was bizarre. that? <laughs> and now there's probably not a single analog photograph. <laughs> there's, I think there's two of the, the cream, cream spotted mountain snake that I photographed in the early 90s that hasn't been photographed since. Does it still exist then? Is it like a yes, unicorn? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so it occurs high up in, uh, in the KwaZulu Natal Drakensberg, and there's been one or two photographs on social media that looks like it could be one. Mm. Um, but, uh, but we haven't, we've, we haven't put much effort into finding it. You know, we've been up there for an hour or two and we haven't okay. found any, but we need to put the effort in. We need to go and find it. We need some DNA. We need to do some work on it. Why the fear around snakes and spiders? What, and, and let's take the biblical connotation out of this, but humans seem to be terrified and they go to, um, or their default position when they see a snake is grab a spade and not yes. to pick it up. It's to smack it over their head with. Yes, pecking up is also not a good idea, obviously. Um, but I think, you know, if we, if they, they, they do suffer from a bad press, and we, mm. we've seen that uh, over the years. Um, I think it's, it's largely these mysterious creatures. You've got, a, you've got a, a hairy thing with eight legs that just freaks people out, or you've got a, a worm like creature that disappears down holes, climbs trees, uh, is very secretive. So a lot, of it, a lot of the fear, and we see that with our courses. A lot of the fear is just a lack of knowledge. You know, people just mm. don't understand them. They just don't get it. And as we teach them more about snakes and their behavior, uh, they sort of soften up a bit and they get to understand them a bit better. Now, this book, like all your others, published by Straight Nature. And well done to them because they, if, if you're looking for books on nature, they're the go-to. They really and truly are. But with that in mind, Johan, talking about things that sort of vanish down, down holes when you least expect them to. Uh, or pop out of a hole when you least expect them to. Are there, do people go on snake safaris? You know, are there a big five of snakes? Because I know for myself, if I'm in the bush, I'm looking for 
things with teeth and claws because that's where my interests lie. But if I see a snake, I get so excited because it's such a rarity for me. But are there, what do you call yourselves, herpetologists who go out on snake safaris? Well, herpetologists are permanently scratching around trying to find <laughs> stuff. And, and finding snakes is not easy. You know, I've done surveys where we'd, we'd spend three days in the bush and not find a single snake. Uh, but our record with uh, Luke, Kemp, Bianca, and myself in the Free State is we got 98 snakes in one day in the morning in the Free <laughs> State. So it just depends on where you are, circumstances, you know, sometimes certain uh, weather conditions bring them mm -hmm. out, temperatures. Uh, we don't fully understand all of that. So it's, right. um, it's a difficult thing. There are, there are, uh, are people that come out and, and want to go look for snakes. We, we're very wary of that because poaching snakes is still a big issue. Really? So we're very wary of giving out localities for rare stuff, for small adders. Um, and uh, except for KwaZulu Natal, uh, snakes are protected in every other province. So you're not allowed to go out and catch a single snake in okay. any province other than KZN unless you have the necessary permits. Obviously. Now, the, the biggie here in South Africa seems to be this fellow, uh, if I can figure oh. out the This yeah, most that's big a, that's a problem snake. snake. Yep. Why is it such a problem? This one tends to come and visit. It doesn't wait for you to come to it. It will come to you and it will climb into yep. bed with you and then bite you for no apparent reason. So I, I always tell people that uh, any snake encounter, whether it's a kid at school or someone on a hike or in your garden, uh, if you come across any snake, the, you know, the best course of action is to back off five paces immediately. And if you do okay. that, you're perfectly safe. You can't get bitten. There's no chance. Okay. But Mozambique spinning cobras are a problem. And we see the same behavior with zebra cobras in Namibia. We see the same with the crates in India. Uh, these snakes often end up in houses. They, they're active in the early evenings. Uh, they are uh, prolific. They are voracious feeders. They eat just about anything. And um, they'll get to a wall. And if they get to a wall, they go left or right. And they go left and you have an open sliding door or you've got a gap under your front door big enough for the snake to crawl through. And they end up in a house and they find a sleeping mammal and they bite people. They bite people. Uh, we see 40 to 60 kids a year being bitten in the face. We see people that sleep on the floor getting bitten on the face or on the body. We see people in expensive lodges in the Kruger Park where they're spending $1,000 a night. They're getting bitten in the face. And um, initially it was thought that uh, these snakes are looking for heat, but we know that's mm -hmm. not the case because it happens in summer. Uh, it was thought that maybe people are rolling over onto the snakes, accidentally ending up in your beds, uh, in beds. But we have ample evidence that it's not the case. They they are finding a mammal in the bed and they are mistaking us for a meal, and they are actually biting people. So with with snake bites, we often differentiate between defensive bites mm -hmm. and uh, and and feeding bites. And defensive bites, quite often, there'd be known venomation. You get okay. bitten by let's say a mamba, and, and nothing happens. But mm -hmm. with these feeding bites, they inject a lot of venom. And these Mozambique spinning cobra bites are feeding bites. They inject a lot of venom, and it does a lot of damage. With, with that in mind, do you do, has this new edition focused a lot more on the medical aspect of, of um, snake bites, how to treat it, both in humans and in animals, for that matter? Yeah, David, we've got into uh, the medical treatment in a bit of detail, not to the level where a doctor can use it as a guideline on exactly how to treat specific bite. Right. That is extremely complex. And um, I am, in fact, busy with a book called The Medical Treatment of Snake Bite in Southern Africa. And I have Luke Kemp and Dr. Colin Tilbury as co-authors. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be very extensive and it will treat, it will, it will, it will look at every single species with great detail on exactly how medical doctors should treat every single snake bite, but that's a, that's a whole different story. And, and for one in the future, and that's not going to be, a, uh, that'll be um, a new, new edition. It won't be an yes. update. <laughs> yes, we'll probably, we'll probably uh, finish the manuscript within about a year, and then it'll mm -hmm. take another a year before it's on the shelves. So it's a big project. Um, I'd asked you before we started uh, today, he says, looking to share my screen again, um, I know you've just come back from, from the USA. You and Bianca went to be keynote speakers at a, a conference, and you decided to look for raptors and gila monsters, and you seem to have found a couple of both. 
Not hey, raptors, rattlers, sorry, rattlesnakes I'm talking rattlers, about. Rattlers, not, rattlers, yeah, rattlers, yeah. not raptors. Yeah. Raptors we've got yeah. here. <laughs> um, so my two best friends are uh, Randy Babb from Arizona. He was with Arizona Fish and Game most of his life. And Paul Muller from uh, Paul was with Florida Fish and Game. Mm -hmm. um, so I met up with them as well as another good friend, Ab Abercrombie and his wife, Chris. Uh, and we met up in Phoenix and uh, we went looking for rattlesnakes specifically. Right. And, uh, Arizona has 13 species. Okay. So we were there for 10 days and uh, we had a phenomenal trip. We found uh, four Gila monsters in one evening, which is unheard of. And we ended up with uh, 42 rattlesnakes of eight different species and a tap of just over 60 snakes. And all of that wow. in 10 days. It was an unbelievable trip. And, and, and what is so special about this particular reptile that you're holding here? Well, the Gila monsters are, uh, are, are quite unique in that it's the only highly venomous uh, group of lizards in the world. There are two of them, the Gila monster and the beaded lizard. The beaded lizard mm -hmm. is more down into Mexico. Uh, and the Gila monsters, it's a little bit like our rock monitors, our legavans. Okay. They just, they just crawl through the bush, do their own thing. They eat <laughs> what they can find. But they're venomous and they differ from snakes in that the fangs and the venom apparatus is on the lower jaw. Oh, okay. Um, and they, their bite is a bit like a puff out of bite. Cytotoxic, a lot of pain, a lot of swelling, mm -hmm. a lot of tissue damage. Um, yes, and they're just very, very special lizards. All right, so let's leave that alone because that doesn't form part of your book, and that's what we're chatting about today. I just wanted to go off on a tangent. Um, and another thing is I found this image of a tattoo that's being done here in Johannesburg currently. And my question to you is, a, is it an accurate portrayal of the snake and the background for that matter? And B, do you have or would you have a tattoo done? So it's very clearly uh, the, the sort of golden brown phase of the Cape Cobra, uh, mm -hmm. very accurately done, uh, making a bit of a hood. Uh, what I like even more about the tattoo is that it's up on, a, on, on an acacia, and that's exactly where they where they go. Uh, in fact, there's a, there's a great study in Swala at the moment with um, Prof. Graham Alexander and uh, Dr. Brian Moritz, where they're looking at the impact of these uh, Cape Cobras and sociable weaver nests. Mm. And in some of those nests, the snakes take out the entire brood for the year. Not a single chick survives. Wow. So that's, that's quite fascinating. It's a, it's a beautiful tattoo. Uh, David, I don't have any tattoos yet. Um, it's uh, being a conservative Afri Afrikaans boy. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, uh, Bianca loves them, and she has some gorgeous ones. Uh, okay. So no, I haven't. I haven't uh, given that much thought. I know this particular artist, so I'll put Bianca in touch with him. <laughs> good, good stuff. Be because I do believe. Let's just stop that for a second. I do believe that that would make a stunning tattoo. The cover, absolutely, the snake on your on your cover. Who did this? Absolutely. This particular this um, image. Yeah, that's one of my photographs. Okay, did. Was it difficult for you um, to to choose the images that you were going to use uh, for for the various snakes and also for the cover because the cover of the previous edition is um, a green mamba if I'm not mistaken. No, no, no. It's one of the harmless green, green snakes. snakes. Okay. No, it's, a, no. it's a, one of the harmless green snakes. Oh, in fact, he said. Yeah, green it's green. A, it's the eastern um, the eastern Natal green snake. Yeah, that's the eastern Natal green snake. Just to prove that, yeah, I, that covers, I have the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Covers, covers are, 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 are difficult because uh, you look at various options. Uh, your publisher will have a, get their uh, uh, staff together and everyone will comment on a cover. Right. And there's, there's, no, there's no recipe for a great cover. You know, you can get 10 people to agree on a cover and it can either work or it won't. Yeah. Uh, and this, in this instance, they chose incredibly well. Selecting photographs is a nightmare. Because to some degree, you want to show variation in color within, within a species. And, and, and what I did with this book is I, I sent a large selection to the publisher and got their designers to choose it. And okay. overall, it chose very well. But there were a few instances where we had to make some changes. And having gone through the book now that it's published, it's on the shelves. Has somebody contacted you or have you looked, at the, have you looked through the book and go, oh, heck, there's a spelling mistake on page three? Why did nobody Absolutely. do that? <laughs> yeah, we so we we go to great extremes to find spelling errors, and um, I think I, I think I picked up three already, and all three are names or surnames of contributing photographers. Oh heck! <laughs> <laughs> so that was one area where we should have focused a bit more. 
but it's a minor problem because uh, it'll be reprinted soon. It's selling like crazy. Mm -hmm. And with the reprint, we quickly correct those, those few minor spelling errors. Have you changed the layout of the interior of the book at all compared to, to the original? Yes, not dramatically so. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, one of the one of the, the things that I've often said about the previous edition, you know, in South Africa, if uh, if uh, uh, if someone writes a book on poetry and they sell three thousand copies, it's a bestseller, and they have a, a black tie dinner. Um, <laughs> previous edition has sold close to a hundred thousand copies. Wow. I've never had the black tie dinner yet. You know? No, come so on, we must speak to Belinda a, and the people at Straight. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a phenomenally. It's, I mean, for a, for a natural history book. To sell those numbers is just a, a total mind blow. Um, I should imagine so. so is, and is it sold internationally um, in book form, Johan, or is it sold yes. more as an ebook? Um, it's sold more as an ebook. You know, one of the logistical problems with the South African market is to get getting your book into the yeah. international market. So yes, it's sold through guys like Amazon, mm -hmm. but um, it, you know, there's no co-edition. You don't have a German or an American co-edition. Oh. Um, but yes, it does sell well internationally, and I see it now. You know, I get to the, like this conference in San Antonio in Texas. Most of the people at the conference have my book. <laughs> That's it's, uh, wonderful. It's yeah. It, it, so with that in mind, do you and Bianca, or maybe just you, walk into an exclusive book, find the book on a shelf and go in a very loud voice, oh my goodness me, Johan has brought out a new edition. I must purchase this. And then look around to see if anybody's heard you. David, I've never done that, but I learned a very good trick from Wilbur Smith. And he actually yeah. did this. Is what you do is you go into the bookshop and you rearrange the books in the shelf to make yours have more prominence. Yeah. So that, that I do very often, yes. I, I know years ago, I was friendly with an author and we used to do exactly that. We used to go into the various bookshops, find her book. And if it was that way on the shelf, it became that way. And instead Absolutely. of being in South African literature, we'd put it in international. <laughs> we shipped it all <laughs> over the place. I'm sure the staff wondered why the book was migrating from place to place. Yard again with snakes. Obviously, we humans don't want them in urban gardens um, for a variety of reasons. You may like your child. You may like your yep. pet. Um, and if you don't, you can leave the snake there. It will eventually do the work for you. And then you don't have to report it to the police. But what, what should people do if they do find a snake? And it's, I sh should imagine, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, that it might well just be a brown house snake um, or something of that ilk, which isn't dangerous and maybe could be used as a learning experience for, for a child or even the homeowner. So it's, it's problematic because we have so many venomous snakes. Yeah. And there's obviously no room in a suburban garden uh, for venomous snakes if you have kids or if you have dogs and cats around. Mm. Um, so um, some people do create uh, environmentally friendly gardens for, for snakes. Right. And we obviously really enjoy that. But uh, with venomous snakes, it's problematic. So what we usually recommend is, is don't try and catch or kill the snake. Mm. That's just looking for trouble. You know, if you're five paces away, you're perfectly safe. But if you move into that danger zone, you're looking for trouble. So we have uh, on our free app, the ASI app, we have over 700 snake removers and they, they geocache. So if you're in Hootsprate mm -hmm. and you see a snake in your garden and you press on uh, snake removal, the names of the local snake removals are, okay. uh, removers are, will pop up and it will also tell you how many kilometers they are away from you. It's like and you Uber. can just call them and they'll, and they'll come through and, and take them away for you. Now, so, uh, if, so use it. now, on the other hand, if you have a property and you're looking for snakes, can you can you contact ASI and say, listen, I have a, a whatever, um, and I'd like, if you do catch snakes in an urban surrounding and you'd like to release them on my property, please put my name into your database. Now, it's a nice idea, but it doesn't really work oh, okay. because snakes have a mind of their own. And if your garden was suitable for snakes, you would have snakes. Okay. So what you should rather do is just create a suitable environment that might be uh, water features because they attract frogs. A lot of snakes eat frogs. You might want some uh, some some rockeries, some hiding places, some logs lying around. 
Uh, if you have bird feeders, you're going to attract the birds, you're going to attract rodents, and that will bring the snakes in. Okay. Now, what, what I'm saying is if, if you have, if you live on a game reserve and your snake catcher in hood spread has now got some stuff and he goes, can I come and drop them off at, at, at your game reserve because the, the guys in town don't want them type of thing? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a nice idea, but, but they just don't stick around. So what we've <laughs> seen with, uh, with guys like Nick Evans in Durban, mm -hmm. uh, who removes probably about 100 black mamas a year, he, he microchips everyone okay. and then releases them. And he very rarely gets recaptures because really? once they get into, once you relocate them, uh, even though the, the area might look very suitable to you, uh, the snake has to make that decision. So the snake <laughs> has to find the spot where it's comfortable basking, mm -hmm. where it uh, has a nice hole to live down, where there's ample food, and uh, and that takes that takes quite a bit of time and effort. So they usually sort of scatter off and they disappear, okay. and eventually they will find a, a suitable a suitable area to live in. Now, talking about television programs on snake catching, there, there are a couple of reality TV series at the moment that, that seem to focus in KZN and focus on black mambas. Do those programs do more harm than good? Because obviously there has to be, there ha uh, there has to be some sort of interaction because you can't just walk in as a snake catcher and go, okay, we put it in a tube and off we go. Then there needs to be something for the cameras. So initially, um, I was quite critical of these programs because they drama, and mm. and most of these programs are totally set up. You know, yeah. you rent snakes from the snake park, you put them in the house, you ask people to scream, you go and you take them out. Um, uh, but having said that, what we see with our courses, and you know, we have about six thousand people a year coming through our courses, so we interact with a lot of people, we get a lot of feedback, and we find that these programs are incredibly popular especially with African people. They just love them. So I think from an awareness point of view, these programs do a great deal. They, 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 they really get people aware of snakes. They get people interested. So despite all the drama and everything else that goes with these reality programs, uh, they, they're excellent for snake awareness. They really do a good job. And between that and your book, obviously, it, it helps the, the populace to learn more about the snakes and more particularly what they do for the environment because they, they have... A reason for being where they are. Yes, absolutely right, and um, and that's the part where we move in because what we find with a lot of these programs is that the accu the, the the accuracy of the information is wanting. Mm. But then we move in, and and one of the things that I've done in this book, uh, more so than even in previous editions, is we've gone to great extremes to make absolutely sure that it's factually correct. We we've, we've gone through the literature, all the scientific literature. And one of the one of the errors that uh, one could easily one of the traps you could easily fall into is that you parrot previous incorrect information. Yeah. So there's something written about black mamas eating uh, flying ants in the Kruger Park in one of the Sand Park publications, and then maybe uh, it was mentioned in one of Bill Branch's books, and I mentioned the previous book. But then when we give it some serious thought and we look at the information that we have on black mamba diets, uh, we come to the conclusion that it's extremely unlikely that that actually happened. And then we discard it. We don't use that sort of information. Fair enough. And you put that in, did you think you know? Um, yeah. And, but it's wrong. Do you have a favorite snake, Johan? Yeah, it's a question that I'm asked very often. And, and not being a snake keeper, you know, I'm not, I, think, I think you either have a collected gene or you don't. And I lack that gene. I don't really collect <laughs> stuff. Um, but I do, if I had to choose one, uh, it would be the green mamba. Uh, to, it's just a beautiful snake. Uh, uh, those bright, vivid green colors, uh, the fact that it lives in, in vegetation that is fairly active, it actually displays very nicely. So if you go to a, a decent snake park and you see a, a green mamba in a really nicely decorated enclosure, they're mm. just absolutely stunning. So yes, now, that would be my favorite. You mentioned in passing the courses that you run and um, ASI, the African Snake Institute, of which you are CEO. Tell us a bit about the work and that ASI does and the courses that you do, because you, I'm glad that I found you at home because you're <laughs> always on the road. Yeah, I'm, uh, tomorrow morning early, we're heading for, uh, for Ken Hart in the Northern Cape. We have training up there, uh, uh, so we, yeah, we, we are busy. Um, with regards to the ASI, you know, uh, our, main, our main function is to provide uh, training. Uh, we provide snake awareness courses, uh, first aid for snake bite, venomous snake handling, 
And a lot of these courses are for corporates. They're for solar farms, they're for wind farms, they're for mines. And we work in about 19 African countries where we provide these courses. But we also do it for the public. You know, there's this massive mm-hmm. demand. And uh, we, what we find nowadays when we have a course here in Johannesburg at Cradle Moon, on average, we have 40, 50 people attending the course. So they become incredibly popular. Uh, and these are just members of the public, uh, people that have a, a, a fear of snakes, that have an interest in snakes. Uh, they might spend a lot of time uh, hiking in the field. So that is a large part of what ASI does. But we're also the largest supplier of all the snake handling equipment, snake gaiters, first aid kits for snake bite. Um, and again, we, we, we ship our equipment all over Africa. But in addition yeah. to these activities, we also have uh, the African Snake Bite Institute Foundation. And through our foundation, it's a registered nonprofit organization. Right. We, um, we've developed over 130 posters. If you want a poster of uh, the common snakes of Johannesburg, the dangerous snakes of Cape Town, uh, snakes of the low felt, they're all on our website. They're free downloads. Uh, and we're also in the process of establishing 2025 anti-venom banks. We will want to make antivenom available 24 hours a day because this is a big problem. We often have a, a snake bite in a remote area on a Friday night, and the local hospital has no antivenom, and then it's a mad scramble. So we're busy with that say. as well. Johan, yeah. thank you so much. We're coming to the end of our chat. The book is The Complete Guide to Snakes of Southern Africa. It's the uh, new edition. It's by Johan Maria. It's published by Straight Nature. Johan, thank you so very much for chatting to me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Wish you all the best with this book. And uh, I look forward to your next one. Thank you, David. Much appreciated.